Hi, I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal and you're in the stream. Today, the Kurds in Syria. How will Turkey's plan to establish a safe zone in northern Syria impact the region's Kurdish population? If you have questions or comments on this issue, we'll try to get them answered. So share your thoughts with us via Twitter or in our live YouTube chat. A five-day ceasefire has just ended in northern Syria, and now Turkey and Russia are ready to establish a safe zone for Syrian refugees. So what does this mean for the Kurds who are already living there? Following the sudden withdrawal of U.S. troops from the region, Turkey embarked on Operation Peace Spring, a military plan intent on pushing Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic forces away from the Syria-Turkey border. Its goal is to create an area where Syrian refugees could be repatriated. After a week of fighting with Kurdish forces, Turkey agreed to a five-day ceasefire last Thursday. Now, despite that agreement, shelling and other military action have been reported, and around 180,000 civilians have been displaced. That's according to the UN. Aid groups are worried that Turkey's operation could spark a humanitarian crisis. So today we'll discuss how the latest foreign policy moves in Syria will affect the Kurds. And joining us to discuss this, in Erbil, Iraq, Shivan Fazl, a Kurdish political analyst. In Doha, Al Jazeera senior correspondent, Natasha Gunam. In London, Alev Sarikhan, an anthropologist at the London School of Economics. She's also an activist with the Kurdish women's movement. And in Istanbul, Yusuf Aram, a political analyst with TRT World. Good to have you all with us. And guests, as we were getting ready for this show, there was a news break on Al Jazeera. We saw these pictures, <laughs> President Erdogan, President Putin, in conversation in a news conference, which directly related to the conversation we're about to have. Malika. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is what is dominating our feeds right now. People online, especially on Twitter, are talking about it. So I wanted to share this tweet from Sonar. Sonar is the director of Turkish Research Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And uh, Sonar writes, the outcome of that news conference, the Putin-Erdogan meeting in Sochi today indicates that Erdogan has become a master of leveraging the US and Russia against each other to maximize Ankara's gains. Turkey got the safe zone it wanted all this time. So he seems to, to put it out there as though this was a very strategic move. Shivan, what is your take on what we saw today in this press conference and on the operation that preceded it? Well, thanks for having me. I'd like to differ with uh, Mr. Sonar Chakapai, actually. I think the master is not President Erdogan, but it's actually President Putin. And amid the precipitous uh, U.S. withdrawal in Rojava, or northeastern Syria, it's actually Putin that has managed to drive a wedge between the European and NATO allies. Turkey has been acting against the interests of the West and, more specifically, the NATO uh, in the Middle East, and more specifically in Syria, for the past six years. And I think the winner of the U.S. withdrawal and the Turkish incursions in northeastern uh, Syria, it's Mr. Putin who finally achieved its objectives by uh, driving a wedge uh, between NATO allies. Mm. Yusuf, your president said uh, of President Putin, my dear friend Putin, what difference does the involvement of Russia make to the current operation in that northeastern side of Syria? It makes a great difference because while you've reached a deal diplomatically at the table with uh, the Americans uh, via the Pence Erdogan agreement in Ankara last week, uh, for, that to, for that diplomacy to trickle down into the field, uh, you need to sit down and also have that deal reaffirmed with the Russians because they're the ones with boots on the ground and uh, they're the ones who are the guarantor for the regime. So uh, I partly agree with uh, Sonarbe's uh, uh, tweet saying that Turkey got what it wanted. It got most of what it wanted. Not everything, but most of what it wanted. It had to make some compromises, but this is diplomacy. And uh, in the end, Turkey launched an operation that lasted seven days. And in that seven days, it was able to secure 120 kilometers by, 300, uh, by 35 kilometers deep. And for the rest of that safe zone area, the rest of the uh, 444 kilometers outside of the 120 kilometer area, it was able to secure most of what it wanted. And it did this diplomatically without loss of life. It was able to avoid sanctions from the United States. 
Uh, it was able to uh, save its relationship with the U.S. without escalating it further. It was able to further cement its relations with the Russians also, and most importantly, address its national security concerns uh, versus the group known as the YPG, the People's Protections Unit. Uh, this is a Kurdish paramilitary group operating mm -hmm. the, in the area. Right. Turkey views them as terrorists. Americans call them coalition partner. And frankly, they have direct links to a group that has uh, tried to divide and uh, fracture the territorial integrity of Turkey for 40 uh, years. Right, Yusuf, you're having the whole debate by yourself. Let me bring in a few other people here. Natasha, uh, uh, Yusuf was talking about this seven-day operation. During those seven days, on the ground, refugees and Syrians moving from northeast Syria into Iraq. I want to play, just I'm showing people here your Twitter feed because you were there actually doing some reporting. This lady is called Nada. And then I want you to tell us more about the stories of the Syrians you had to flee. We are Syrian, but we hate our country. We don't want to go back. Nedra and her sister each paid a smuggler $600. She says she and her two young children walked for five days. I was alone in the desert. Everybody left. It was just me and my children. I was suffering. This latest. So, Natasha, while all of the, on the very high level, there was politics going on a very high level, you were down on the ground with real people. What were you seeing? What were you hearing? Well, first of all, despite the ceasefire, the number of Syrian refugees that continued to be smuggled over the border spiked in that duration. So we're now at about more than 7,000 Syrian refugees, primarily Kurds, who have been smuggled over the border into Iraq um, to escape this Turkish incursion. So why are they being smuggled? People tell us, they told us repeatedly, and aid groups are confirming that Kurdish fighters on the Syrian side at checkpoints were prohibiting them from crossing. So they were forced to pay smugglers, in some cases a few hundred dollars a head. And uh, as you just heard from one of the women I spoke to named Nedra, <coughs> they walked five days in the desert. Her kids, she had two kids, they were toddlers. Honestly have no idea how they made it. But in any event, these people were saying, yes, we've been displaced several times in our own countries, throughout this more than eight year long war. But for many of them, um, this was the first time they had actually left Syria. And this was their first stint in, a, in an actual refugee camp. And uh, look, I think there's been a lot of uh, discussion about geopolitics, who's gaining, who's losing. And at the end, as has often been the case, especially uh, in my firsthand experience, it's the Syrian people who are suffering the Syrians that I spoke to do not want to go back home. They're afraid of ISIL sleeper cells. They're afraid of ISIL fighters who were um, in detainment camps who've escaped. They're afraid of what will happen to them once Syrian forces move into cities that had been predominantly controlled by Kurds. They worry about persecution and repercussions. And they simply, again, the people that I've spoken to have no hope. And what's different is Throughout the uh, war, when I've spoken to refugees, they've talked about the hope of going home, the dream to return to their homeland. This time is very different. I think that they're really at their wits end, and the people that I've spoken to said that they are now looking to begin their lives anew in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Elif? Uh, um, I think, you know, I, I agree with... Uh, Natasha's focus on speaking about the human aspect of what's happening, because when it comes to big geopolitics, often this is uh, missed. And it's important to understand, you know, whether it's a whether it was the so-called 120-hour uh, ceasefire or before, you know, in practice, um, we, we've seen and it's been widely reported that there was actually never a ceasefire either. The Turkish state and its allied forces on the ground as well violated the ceasefire 27 times. There's been an amnesty report saying that there's been damning evidence of war crimes committed by uh, the Turkish forces and its allied Syrian forces and a shameful disregard for human life. A British chemical weapons expert, Hamish de Breton-Gordon, has said 
the wounds of many of these people who were taken into hospitals were uh, consistent with the use of the chemical weapon white phosphorus. So when we talk about these geopolitics, Lindsay Hilsom, who was a British Channel 4 reporter, said, put it perfectly. She said, there is a good old fashioned phrase for what Turkey is trying to do, and that is ethnic cleansing. If there has been hundreds of thousands of people already displaced, there's been countless civilian lives um, affected and killed, we need to say it what it is, because there is clearly a play on the, a, 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 yet again, a century on another play on the dynamics and the power play of the Middle East. So we need to make sure that the people are not losing again. You know, after a um, after a year, how you know several years long war against the against ISIS by the Syrian Democratic Forces, eleven thousand fighters were killed to save the whole world from the evil of ISIS. And what does uh, the Turkish uh, state try to do? Essentially, go on an ISIS rescue mission. And what does this mean? The gains of these people who, while fighting against ISIS, were building a democratic, ecological and women's liberationist system is at risk now. And this risks the stability, the future, the civilization of that region, but potentially even the world. When we have a whole world at crisis, we are desperately in need of alternative systems. And this is what the forces, the Syrian democratic forces that are not just Kurds, there are Arabs, Turkmen, many Christian groups were building is now being risk, is being attacked and therefore again trying to impose uh, a century old sectarian conflicts on these people who just want to live together now and don't want authoritarian, dictatorial, fascistic states uh, messing with their livelihoods. And this is exactly what Erdogan's Turkish state is doing. And so, Alif, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think a lot of people in our community would agree with you. I'm seeing those comments come on, on YouTube. But I want to bring this up. Uh, this is a tweet from uh, someone whose handle is Lone Walker. And Yusuf, I'll give this to you. Lone says, Syria is currently in turmoil, with several <coughs> actors contributing towards its instability. However, creating a safe zone by Turkey is a good idea, as it lowers the weight coming with the refugee settlement in that country. And of course, we recently had a show in which you were on where we talked about uh, uh, that issue in Turkey and, and, and the numbers of refugees there. So Turkey says that this idea, this safe, safe zone, is to deal with the numbers of refugees that they have in their country. What do you make of what Elif was saying and what this person says is a good idea? Well, first thing, I want to address the chemical weapons accusation by Elif and uh, uh, parts of the uh, Western media. That is totally inaccurate. Turkey has never had chemical weapons. Turkey has never owned chemical weapons. It has never used chemical weapons in the history of its military, and it never will. It's part it of the Organization of Prohibition on Chemical Weapons. Now, uh, as for refugees, now, Turkey has taken the brunt of refugees during this uh, Syrian com conflict, and I think uh, everyone on this program can agree that uh, what Turkey has done is very commendable and the safe haven that it's provided not only for the 3.6 million refugees inside the country, but also for the 6 million people that it protects in the upper Euphrates shield zone and also in the olive branch zone as well. well so Turkey has... Euros of EU money, right? Turkey didn't well, take care so, of the... So, so, so Elif, you know so, so Elif, Elif, Elif did, did you hear Yusuf? He, he sat and he listened through to all of the points you wanted to make. He sat and he allowed you to make them. And now he's going to have the conversation back with him. Do oh. allow him the same courtesy. Just hold tight for a moment so you can hear him respond. Go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, can I, can I yeah, Turkey got a little please. EU money. Turkey got about uh, 3 billion out of 6 billion euros that was promised. Turkey also spent $40 billion out of its own pocket. This is not my data. This is the United Nations data. So uh, it has played a critical role in protecting these Syrian refugees. But it comes a time when a refugee status turns into a permanent residence. And absorbing this much is just too much for Turkey. It's time to bring these people back. But to bring these people back, they need to have a safe home. Uh, President Erdogan laid out a very good rebuilding program for this area. He's hoping for international support. He's not just trying to dump these people back into Assad's lap. He's trying to pr provide a safe area for them, trying to pr provide a home to go back for them. 
I think that's a very commendable job. And so, Yusuf, let me just let me just go that. to yeah. President Erdogan from the news conference. Shiva, and I hear you. Uh, um, Yusuf mentioned um, Operation Olive Branch, which is in the northwestern part of Syria, where uh, President Erdogan says that there's been a, a safe space created for refugees. He is hoping to do the same part in the same thing in the northeastern part of Syria. Let's have a listen back to that press conference. This is how he described it. We have secured. 4,000 square kilometer area and cleared it from terrorists. This area that we have secured and made safe, 360,000 refugees have repatriated voluntarily. At some time, Syrian land was always mentioned with terror attacks, but now it is reaching tranquility and peace. Hopefully this will apply to the northern Syria. Shivan, what do you make of Turkey's argument that there needs to be an area in Syria where Syrians can feel safe and that refugees can either come back to or people can live safely? What do you make of that? Well, let me tell you what's Turkey's aim in creating this uh, so-called safe zone in northeastern Syria or Rojava. What Turkey wants to create is to create a breath buffer zone between the Kurds in the southeast of Turkey and the Kurds in Rojava, and also to ethnically cleanse these areas from it is original inhabitants, which includes predominantly Kurds inhabitants, among other ethnic and religious minorities, and displacing these original populations and resettling them with Arab Syrian refugees out of the 3.5 million refugees that Yusuf is referring to. My question for Yusuf would be, how many out of these 3.5 million refugees that Turkey is accommodating are Kurds? Why did Turkey never had to accommodate the Syrian refugees among the, um, the Kurdish Syrian refugees among the 3.5 million or so-called number that he is referring to? In so fact, Turkey not has accommodate do you want him, Shiva, do you, do you want Yusuf Turkey. to answer that question? Because in that case, you'll need to pause. Like, I would like to complete, I would like to complete, and then maybe he can refer back to uh, the question that I posed. I would like to continue by saying that Turkey not actually not accommodating the Syrian refugees or the Kurdish Syrian refugees. They have also not created a safe zone for their own uh, fair share of Kurdish inhabitants in the southeast of Turkey. I think... The ramifications Sh of Shivan, did, did you did you actually want him to answer that question? Did you want Yusuf to answer that question? Yusuf, go I ahead. I think it was answer a rhetorical question. question. All right, all right, okay. They had they had uh, the Turkey has taken in three hundred fifty thousand uh, Turkey has taken in three hundred fifty thousand uh, Syrian Kurds who fled Daesh but never returned due to the, the ramifications of the northeast the from ramifications. the the ramifications of Turkish actions in Rojava is very clear. As we have seen from Natasha's report, we have seen civilians fleeing in mass already and perhaps giving an opening to ISIS resurgence, which is basically has been Turkey's double gamble all along in the past six, seven years in the war Shivan. and campaign. Against it, it, may, Shivan, may, I, may I jump in for a moment? May I jump in? No, Natasha, yeah, yeah, you, yes, you, you, you've been... Let, let, let's allow Natasha into the conversation. She's been very patient. Sure. Natasha, go ahead. Yusuf mentioned the, uh, the, the impact that this refugee crisis during the Syrian war mm. has had on Turkey. Um, I just want to mention that there is a, uh, this Turkish incursion has magnified and uh, created a, another wave of a humanitarian emergency in Iraq. Let's bear in mind that Iraq is already hosting more than a million internally displaced people of its own in addition to refugees. And prior to this incursion beginning, uh, the government was saying that the international aid it relies on to assist these people had been cut in half. So it's affecting its ability to provide basic services, such as water, education, health care, et cetera. And when this incursion began, there was not even, I was there last Wednesday, there was not even a camp to begin accommodating the Syrian refugees who were coming in. They took a camp that had been shuttered for the last year. It had been hosting people who fled the Mosul offensive and it had emptied out. They took that camp and we were there last Wednesday when they were hastily erecting tents. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is an emergency um, occurring right now in Iraq as a result of this incursion. The Kurdistan regional government is saying we do not have the funds 
we need to combat it. And their numbers, they've done some number crunching. They say that if, in fact, the fighting goes on for another couple of weeks, they expect mm. 30 to 50,000 people. If there is a protracted um, uh, violence in Syria, they are worried that there will be as many as 250,000 people coming over their borders. Mm. You mentioned the humanitarian crisis or a coming humanitarian crisis uh, in Iraq. And I, and I would venture to say that via comments we're getting from people online, they're worried that this humanitarian crisis will extend to the entire region when it comes to Kurds. So we got a comment on YouTube from Mamadou who says, is this safe zone a temporary or permanent safe zone uh, for these people living there? And it's a good question, keeping in mind this headline, which we all saw not too long ago, uh, which really raises a question on how safe conditions will be uh, for people in the region. This headline from Reuters, for Syrian Kurds, a leader's killing deepens a sense of U.S. betrayal. This was a politician. Her name has been hashtagged. You can see it here. Havrin Khalaf, the horrific death, someone tweets, is devastating and sickening. As a Kurdish woman, I can't imagine her last thoughts and feelings in the hands of what this person calls Turkish terrorists. I'm terrified for women and girls in Ro Rojava, an unbearable loss that's left me devastated and heartbroken. So this was a politician uh, who was killed and, and it was caught on tape. You can see her hashtag, of course, going viral on Instagram. What does this mean, Elif, for civilians and everyday people that are living in the region, what are they feeling right now? Because I know you're talking to people who are there. Yeah, I mean, this it's, it's a very uh, interesting mix and combination of emotions because obviously people are fearful because uh, there has been many uh, ISIS sleeper cells that have been activated because of the Turkish invasion. There have actually been attacks, but also um, there's obviously more of a risk. They feel like they made than paid the biggest sacrifice to <clears throat> defeat ISIS territorially and to essentially protect the whole world from the evil of ISIS. But now they're obviously angry, they're, they're scared, but they're determined because they're determined because they weren't just fighting against ISIS, but they were also building a system where all the peoples of the region, respecting the beautiful mosaic of the Middle East, can coexist together peacefully. And now, because of this... Um, because of this power battle uh, uh, of uh, Erdogan, because he feels like he needs to somehow garner support again. He's losing popularity domestically in Turkey. So he feels like he needs to be a war hero and therefore has a shameful disregard for human life because he needs to gather support again. There's a risk of a new party forming in his own country and he needs to be able to uh, once again garner the nationalist vote and become a war hero. And we know from history that for at least a century, many Turkish state leaders do this by killing Kurds. This is a historical mm -hmm. fact. It's not so, a speculation. So, so, so guess, I, I just have to get this in because we're, we're, we're hurtling towards the end of the program and this is so important. Whenever we talk about Turkey and Syria, and the Kurds, there's always some history that we have to talk about. Let me just show you, Syria, who controls what. This is a, a <laughs> rainbow map of, of who is in charge of what parts of Syria. I'm just going to point out to you some areas that are really important. So this area here, the yellow area here, the yellow area here. Hold tight, Shivan. I'm going to ask you to hold tight, please. Is the area that is the, the northeastern part of Kurdistan, uh, excuse me, of Syria, controlled by uh, the Kurds and then here is Turkey and then Turkey over many years have lost around about 40,000 people in attacks by the Kurdistan Workers Party. Looking at this map it just seems strategically Yusuf that it makes sense that you would want to have an area here that you would see as a protective area. Am I jumping to analysis here that Turkey isn't seeing, or is this strategically for you why Turkey would say, hey, we need a, a, a safe zone here? Does that protect Look, Turkish citizens more? There, there's, it's very clear that there's two objectives to Operation Peace Spring and to the culmination of all these military operations. One, showing up Turkish national security to providing a place for these refugees to come home to. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to also talk about very quickly, uh, let's let's remember what Raqqa looked like after the U.S. Can coalition. I? Let's remember what Aleppo looked like after uh, Russian airstrikes. Now, look at what the, all the areas that Turkey has launched military operations in. 
the ratio of these buildings right. intact is over 87 percent in these areas that Yusuf, Turkey has launched operations Yusuf, in. They've we, been very, very We take you to the end. You're taking us to the end of the show. Shiv and I hear you. Natasha and Elif and yeah. Yusuf, thank you so much for being part of this program. We're getting new news in about what means for this ceasefire and the cooperation between Russia and also Turkey. This story is not over yet. Continue to watch it at audizero.com. And now for the stream, Luke and I say thank you for watching. See you next time. Take care.